So right before we get started, although it seems like a lot of people kind of knew each other, right before we start, I always like for people to say hi to those sitting around you that you don't know. That's really nice to do. So just let's take a moment and just say, hello, how are you, friends, <laughs> family? <laughs> Okay, so now you, at least you feel like you know some people, have some sense of community. Anybody who would come here on a Thursday night to meditate is probably very good, you know, good friend to you, you know. <laughs> There's a lot of things you could be doing in the Bay Area on a night like this. So the fact that you come to meditate is really beautiful. Thank you on the behalf of all beings. Uh, so I just want to say a couple of things about meditation, then we're going to start with start the sitting. It's important to have a lot of patience with your meditation, right? Because a lot of times people tell me, I hate meditation because my mind's restless. Does anyone notice having a lot of restlessness when you try to practice? It's very important to take your time. It's like you're training. You're training a wild animal, right? And at first, like, biting and running and just attacking everything. And then very slowly, you just approach it very gently, right? You get closer, like, just calm down. It's okay. You know, nowhere to run to. No need to freak out. Everything in this moment is okay. There's no danger. Right? We have to kind of approach our mind like that a bit. Right? And it takes patience and a certain calmness and a certain kindness. Like, if you approach a wild animal with aggression, it's going to run away really quickly, right? It, you don't even have to, you could just look in the direction and have that energy, right? Like, and it's just gone, right? So you have to be very, play it very calm. Like, that's okay, I'm okay. The mind calms down like that, right? So we don't want to attack anything. We're not trying to get anything. We're not trying to get rid of anything. What we're doing is we're just being in the present moment, right? And that anxiety might be there. That restlessness might be there. So when you notice that, you just say, oh, okay, mind is restless. Mind has anxiety right now. Can I just be calm with this energy? Right? Okay, restlessness, energy, anxiousness, maybe anger even. When you meditate, everything rises. It's not just a blissful stage, right? That was the case. We'd all be just blissing out. Sometimes that happens. But more than not, sometimes difficulties appear. So I just want you to be on the, the lookout that if some energy feels difficult, just name it. Ah, this is what's happening, right? Can I be calm with this, right? And the calmer we are, the more things flow out, right? They just arise and pass, arise and pass, arise. We sit here and the whole world arises in the mind and passes out of the mind, right? You don't have to go anywhere. It's all here, right? We could sit here and travel around the world a million times being Beautiful realms and hell realms, right here in this moment. Notice that, right? So then we start to choose. Ah, let me let go. So we use the body and we use the breath as our meditation guide, right? We train with just gentle body sensations, and the breath is a great way to start. So just again, many of you know the instructions, but it's always good to hear it again. 
right? It's always beginner's mind. Like, how do I meditate again? Oh, yeah. We're always forgetting, by the way. So if you forgot, it's okay, right? You just practice remembering together. Okay, so I just wanted to say that. So find yourself comfortable. We have a lot of cushions and chairs. If you're on the chair, put your feet flat, and you want to kind of sit up a little bit. Because sometimes people get sleepy, right? I don't recommend lying down meditation unless you have an injury, because it's a slippery slope into being asleep, right? So we try to not go there, you know, a lot. Uh, Sitting up is best because it's kind of wakeful, but take care of your body. Again, if you're, so you have an injury, that's totally fine to lie in any position. So as you just sit, you just begin to close your eyes and just take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Just arrive in your body. Just start to feel this body that we call alive, right? It's feeling, feeling your neck and your shoulders. If you need to move your neck and your shoulders around, just letting go of any tension. We're always holding on. Often we're clenching. So see as you close, as you begin to close your eyes and you breathe, take a couple of breaths. See if you can relax your shoulders and your upper body. Relax your face and your jaw, times we hold on there. We just invite in a softness, a receptivity. As you feel your breathing, really relax your belly, also called the hara, this midsection of the stomach area. See if you can breathe in. Let your belly be soft. In each breath that you breathe, just breathe in this kind of soft peace. And you can say that on the in-breath. Just breathing in peace on the in-breath. Breathing out peace on the out-breath a couple of times and you notice the effect on the body. This is the invitation. To be at peace, relax your hands. Your hands be soft. As you feel your body, just begin to notice the rhythm of your breathing. It's not a controlling breath meditation. You just notice the breath in its natural rhythm, where you feel it, in the belly or the chest or the nose. See if you can notice the beginning of a breath and the ending of one breath without struggle. And as you sit, sounds will arise, body sensations will arise, thoughts, all kinds of stories, emotion. We just sit allowing whatever to arise to just arise on its own, rising and passing. When you get lost, come back to the rhythm of your breathing and your body as your anchor. Just this breath, nowhere to go. Just here and now. With kind awareness, gentle awareness. If you notice the mind is wandering, just come back to your breathing and begin again. 
and letting go of stories and worries and thoughts in the mind and connecting to this body and the rhythm of your breathing again. Anytime you get lost, you just begin again. One breath at a time. Last few moments of our sitting, let's do the practice of metta together. And so again, this practice of metta also translated as friendliness and loving kindness. So again, this practice is about wishing yourself well offering compassion to oneself and then others so let's start with ourselves so so just in this moment just getting a sense of yourself you can visualize yourself or you can put your hand on your heart or touch your hand in some ways this is a way to direct just loving kind energy to oneself so just kind of Breathing that in, this kindness. Really? Yeah. And as you imagine yourself, what we do is we just offer these traditional phrases or well wishes. Some call them prayers. And so it helps to say your name, or if you have a nickname, is a way to connect as well. And so. As you hold this image of yourself, we just offer these wishes of may I be happy and peaceful. Or you could say, may you be happy and peaceful, dear one. And just really take that in, this wish of me. May, may I be happy, have happiness and peace. How much we want that for ourselves. And then we offer to ourselves, may I be safe and protected. Because what we love, we protect. May I be safe and protected wherever I go in this world. May I be safe. And then as you're, if you're touching your heart and your, or your hand, really offering this body, really have this body. If your body's been sick or injured or is not feeling well, now's the time we offer, may my body be healthy and strong. And so this body is alive, it's a system, a biological system. Uh, it responds to kindness, it responds to our friendliness. We're really just offering this form. May this body be healthy, radiant and strong.
And then may I live with ease and well-being. And we say that to however life is at this time. May I live with ease and well-being however life is. And then as we close out our metta, we just want to send this good energy to all our family and friends. May our family and friends, our mothers and grandmothers, fathers, grandfathers, children, partners, lovers, dear ones, all the Oaklanders, may all these beings be happy and peaceful. And may our communities of color all over the world be safe and protected, including our girls in Nigeria. May they be safe, our sisters protected. May this planet be healthy and strong. May all beings everywhere be happy and living with ease and well-being. So, okay, I was thinking about what to talk about tonight. And, you know, I always, my life is always kind of the fuel for the class. You know, whatever is happening, it's always so interconnected. <laughs> you know, like I'll start talking about something at the end of class. I'll be like, that's exactly what happened to me, right? Or everything's falling apart. You know, I go through these whole series, like everything fall apart or dark night of the soul. I remember I went through a long like every talk was dark night of the soul for a long time. <laughs> that was like 2013 heading into 2014. Everyone was like, that's exactly where I am, right? It was like, I couldn't get enough of those talks. And sometimes I talk all these series about enlightenment or, you know, and then that feels really right. And then the body, I went over and I had a fascination with that. And I was going on and on like, your body, embodiment, feel the... Uh, And so now I was thinking, I have a topic that I am feeling very passionate about, but it's an unusual one in the sense of, it's not unusual in the sense that you don't hear it here. You actually hear it here a lot. However, I don't talk about it that much. And um, the reason I don't talk about it that much is because I didn't want people to feel there was some kind of pressure. And also, I was still learning for myself about it as a spiritual energy. So what I want to talk about is tonight is about generosity as a spiritual, a powerful spiritual practice I'm discovering more and more for myself. And so the reason I said I didn't talk about it here was that I felt like, oh, people think I want them begging them with the bowls to put money in for EBMC and be like, oh, she's just saying, you know, I always felt like you would feel like I was manipulating it or something. Yeah, EVMC has baskets, yes, and we do have generosity. But tonight, I wanted to talk about this way of living. It's not just about money. It's a way of living our lives. And um, I've been working very actively with this particular quality. In the Dharma, in the Buddhist tradition, this quality of generosity is very high quality. It's a very powerful quality, and it's called one of the paramis. Now, paramis are qualities of heart and mind that we intentionally cultivate. 
Power me is a translated, it's a Sanskrit word that means uh, power. So it's like one of the powers. So there's there's these great ten power me. So there's generosity and loving kindness and truthfulness and renunciation and effort and mindfulness. And there's this great list of all these things we talk about, equanimity. Um, but at the foundation of everything, as I was going through some of the text, you know, and looking at all these different stories, because there's, just like in every great living tradition, there's always a collection of stories, right? It's called the suttas, right? And these are all the Buddha's wanderings, right? And teachings and reflections. And um, they're recorded. You know, we can't know for sure. All of the, te- many of these teachings begin with the title, Thus I Have Heard, right? So it's not saying this is path. It says, Thus I Have Heard. The Buddha was wandering in Jetta Grove, right? And such and such happened, right? So we, we, we treat it as sort of like a, you know, these are teaching stories. But generosity has had this really powerful um, undercurrent in the Buddha's life himself. And uh, this quality, I started to really cultivate it. Um, a couple of years ago, I became, I, I decided to consciously work on this particular power me. I thought this is, and we take up different ones at different times right, qualities of being that we want to cultivate. It could be metta, right, or compassion, right? And it's really important to do this. So look at what we're doing is we're, we're sort of making a recipe here. The recipe is enlightenment. That's where we want to get. That's the baked goods at the end, right? And so we have all these ingredients in the mind, right? And when we're, we're, we sort of don't have enough flour, you can't get the cake to rise, right? It's like, ah, it's not, it's flat, Hey, you know, you do one little error, right, and you get something else, right? So you need to think about your mind as this beautiful, mm, you know, you're, you're sewing it together. You're mixing all these ingredients together. And so it's important to know when something needs to be cultivated, right? It's like, ah, okay, I'm missing this quality. I'm missing... There's something going on where I'm not, I don't feel love for myself, or I don't feel open hearted, or I don't understand this particular thing. We cultivate it. Um, so, generosity is like the foundation of everything. And it's interesting because in this culture, if you go to Asia and you practice in India or in Thailand or Laos or anywhere in Asia, right, you would get generosity would be the first teaching for a long, long time, right? And then they would go on to talk to you about ethics. <laughs> Right, and you'd get a million ethics talks, and be like, okay. And then after they feel like you've had enough generosity and enough ethics, then they would teach you how to meditate, right? And a lot of people are like, okay, let's get through this part. Okay, got it. You know, let's get to the meditation. Here they teach you meditation, and then ethics, and then way at the end, generosity, <laughs> right? And so it's just reversed, you know. So it's okay. That's like we are where we are. You know, we we are here. So I was reflecting also on one of the, um, so I want to talk about this from a few different perspectives, not about it being about money, it's energy. And, and why is the Buddha emphasize this quality so much? Like what is, this is at the foundation of every tradition, right? It's like at the heart of it. Generosity, even to bear witness to generosity, how does it make you feel if you see someone else giving a gift? There's something powerful about that, isn't there? It's like there's a really powerful goodness behind it. That's, I think, one of the keys here. And so I want to talk about that a bit. But the Buddha was, um, in one of the, his famous quotes, he said, if you knew the power of generosity, if you just knew the power, you would never let one meal go by without sharing a piece, a bite with someone. Right? Like if we knew how powerful this was. And I think we kind of innately do know there's a magic to this quality. So the the cultivation of generosity in some way is the beginning of spiritual awakening. And one of the most powerful reasons generosity is so helpful on our spiritual path is that in essence it's about letting go. Right? It's it's about letting go. Right? We how do we learn how to let go? Isn't that really what it's all about here? <laughs> like if we were to put a sign outside, it would be like, let go, everyone. Right? <laughs> like, 
master teaching, but how? We actually have to practice. One of my Tibetan teachers, he used to always say, okay, uh, put one orange in one hand and then practice giving me to the other. <laughs> so letting go is not easy. Even things we don't want, we cling to. That's a deep one, right? Even things you do not want, right? We'll fight for it, right? <laughs> right? Something we don't even want. Yeah, you get it. My siblings and I were like that, you know, like wrestle over something. It's like, oh, well, the minute I get it, I just throw it over, you know, on the ground and wander off. So this part of our mind that clings, there's a part, and this is the part that is the root of a lot of suffering. It is, according to the Buddha, the root of everything, is this holding on. It's not even a clinging. It's translated as thirst. Right? Have you ever felt that feeling? It's like, ah, I've got to have that. Right? It's a heavy, it's a, it, it could be a relationship, a, a anything. Right? It, it, anything. We, we hold on, we hold on to our identity like that. Right? Everything. Our thoughts. Right? So, why generosity is powerful is because it's letting go. We're letting go, we're letting go. We're trying to let go. So, in the beginning, when we take up a generosity practice, <clears throat> We're giving kind of with one hand, like meaning we're holding a little bit with this one. I'll give you guys a story. I have a friend of mine, she's, she's really funny. She's actually from Bulgaria. She's a dancer and she's a, she's a good friend of mine. She has a little bit of a holding on problems, you know, sometimes. So we go to her house, another friend and I went over there and she has um, collected all these beautiful clothes because she's a dancer and she gets gifted things and all this. So she said, oh, I have all these clothes, and um, if you guys want to, you know, have something for you, Spring, I think you would like, you can take wear it to your yoga class. And I was like, oh, how sweet, like, right? Initially, great. Well, how nice, right? So then my other friend was there, and my other friend was like, oh, looking at this box. Now, these are things that she had completely decided she wanted to get rid of. I'm done with these things. I've had them for years. <laughs> oh, God, get, get them out, right? I, I, you guys can have them all. So then we are like, oh, so then you know what happens when you do things like fashion show, right? <laughs> like, oh, that like, is so cute. And as she was watching us put these <laughs> items on, it was like this clinging started to happen. Like, well, I don't know if I was going to give that. Was that one in there? Uh, we're like, yes, yeah. that was in there. Right? And then I would put something on and she'll be like, oh, yeah. I, and I could see. Then she took the box out of the room where we were and we're like pulling <laughs> items out of it, right? Like, and we laugh so hard, you know. And you know, she was like, I don't know why I'm getting like that. I don't even wear these items with seeing you guys. You know, so we, we talked about it as a teacher. That's kind of how we are a little bit, right? We have we have some some of those things going on. So the idea of practicing generosity is to free ourselves because in a moment of giving anything, and there's different types of giving, they talk about it in the suttas as they talk about a normal giving, like you clean your garage out and you throw everything on the curb, right? That's the kind of giving. It's a good giving. I've done that. I recently did that. Put everything outside, like, here you go, right? And the neighbors went through and got all the stuff out and, you know, there was some even nice things. Um, but then there's called a kingly giving. The giving that's a little bit harder, like, ooh, like, that you have to really think about, you know? It's a, it's a kind of, that's a way you could practice. Like, we give the thing that we actually have attachment to. And this is something that I've been practicing with. I have a friend who is my best friend on the whole planet, uh, very dear, like a sister to me. Her and I intentionally practice giving each other gifts that are really hard to give. <laughs> like, Oh, and this beautiful Kuan Yin statue. Okay, like not attached to a lot, but my altar items, right? This big Kuan Yin statue that I got and I loved. And and then it came to me to give it to her, right? It was very hard, actually. I went back and forth and back and forth and I had to drive it down. So I had it in my seat of my car with a seatbelt on it. I was like, am I sure I'm supposed to give it? And I carried it in the house and put it on her altar. And I was like, it's yours. And then... This freedom came, right? It was like, of course, she was so happy. She had been looking at this statue for a long time at my house, right? I was like, oh, it's beautiful. 
And then she turned around and did this, a similar thing to something she was very attached to. So we're just practicing here. Like, what is it like to let go? One of the things about generosity is it bumps us up against the part of ourselves that it feels impoverished. Poverty. And this is something that has been, I was talking to another teacher about it. I said, how do we move our community from poverty to abundance, to to this inner freedom. And he said, we've got to teach more about generosity, as odd as that sounds. It's like, how can you teach about giving when everyone feels like they have nothing? Mm-hmm. Right? It's like, what a paradox. <laughs> right? But the act of giving actually spurs the part of the mind that says, I have more than enough. Right? Because if I can actually share with you, then I have more than enough. I have, I have more than enough. And we have to actually practice this. There's an intentional, it's an intentionality to what we do with it. So we meet the forces of greed and poverty when we try to give, even small things, right? We can, we can encounter that. Um, so we transform that. There's a quotation from the Tao Te Ching that says, one who knows that enough is enough will always have enough. Right? It's an inner sense. One of the great joys that comes from generosity is understanding that no matter how much or how little we have by the world standard, if we know we have enough, we can always give something. And it's not about giving money. Generosity is also about your spirit. Can you show up at a place and give energy, good energy, to where you are? Are you someone who sucks energy from people? You show up and you, t- you look to take things. Right. This is another way. Of it like how are you in a group right are we are we even if we have very little what can we give to the situation right are we takers are we givers how can we switch that right I mean maybe somewhere in the middle sometimes we need to receive and that's powerful sometimes it's important that you're the recipient of generosity right and learning how to receive one of my friends also a student actually here she has a ha- hard time receiving. So every time I see her, I just want to pile on everything onto her. So give you, give you an example. So she might call me and say, well, I only have beans for the last four days. This is a real conversation. Like, I only ate beans. And I'll say, honey, you're only having beans? Well, let me help you, right? And she goes, no, no, no. We go through this whole struggle with that. No, 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 I can't, I can't. Then I go get the items and I happily drive it over and go, look, honey, now you don't have beans. You have more, right? And it's a game that we play. And because it's very hard to her, her whole life to receive anything. So it's a healing to actually receive that, right? And sometimes that's the position that we're in. It's like, can I receive? I think one of the worst things that you could do is to receive a gift ungraciously. Even if a child gives you a, a dead bug, you should celebrate it, right? <laughs> Once this little girl was giving this huge dead beetle and we're at the park, right? It's like, oh, thank you, honey. I love it, right? Every time you see an act of generosity, to celebrate it in any form, anytime you have the thought to give something, even if it's just a moment, like, oh, I could give that, celebrate that moment. That energy is happening, this letting go, this freedom, this interconnectedness. It's important to pay attention to that. That's how you cultivate it, by being present for those moments, right? I love to, there used to be a woman, I used to work at a Uh, adoption agency here in Oakland called Black Adoption Placement Research Center and I had this uh, it was all social workers all women was like 20 women social workers that work there all focused on uh, African-American boys who are in the foster care system and I had this most beautiful supervisor and I just would give her things because she would scream so loud you know and her name was Sylvia she was kind of like everyone's mom you know, or anytime you're having a hard day, you would go in with tea and just sit there and she would just listen. And just beautiful, her own generosity. So I would love to give her gifts because she would be so excited. <laughs> Even if it was just a candle, you know? Be like that, <laughs> right? It was mostly that we thought of her. I think that was the bigger thing, you know, the thing she put on her shelf or, you know, whatever. But it was that we we thought of her 
I think that's what cheered her up. Like, oh, you guys are so sweet. And then she would, you know, get all excited about whatever it was. It's important that when you think about giving, that you have some excitement about that. When you think of something you want to give, even if you're just baking some cookies for your partner, right? That you feel the excitement, oh, they like cookies. Oh, let's get the oatmeal ones. Oh, let's make them. All those moments of beauty and goodness in, is, is what our spiritual practice is about, right? And then the act of giving, right? How we are in that moment. And the Buddha said it's very important to reflect on everything you've given, happily reflect on it, not from an egoic perspective, but in the beginning, there's good feeling. While you're giving, there's a good feeling. And at the end, you reflect on it. Those three pieces to be conscious are really important. That's what makes it grow, right? That's what, that's what keeps it all going. So it also brings a sense of uh, happiness to others. <coughs> you know, when you see, he, even if you read on an article in a magazine about somebody who gave, I was recently uh, watching this documentary about the secret billionaire and then I started to look at all the billionaires who are giving money. Do you guys know Warren Buffett gave $38 billion away? <laughs> I was just thinking like, oh my God. And he left very little for his children. He was like, no, I want to give it all to charity. So he gave $38 billion to um, Bill and Melinda Gates' um, foundation. And he wrote one big check. And it was, it's, a, it's a footage on YouTube. And he was like, here you go. And then he said, I feel so good now. Like, wow, I can't even fathom what that would be like, right? And there's a whole movement of rich people, billionaires, that are saying now, give it all away while you're alive. Give it now. Give it now. Right? This whole movement into generosity-based economics. I just love that. It was touching. Um, so generosity has enormous warm-heartedness in it. It says, I want you to be happy, and I'm going to share with you. Like, I love what I'm having so much. Have a bite, <laughs> right? It's that. It's like, this is for us, not just me. It's for all of us, right? Let's share. Let's share it together. So it doesn't really matter if you feel that you have nothing. It's important that you start the cycle of a spiritual practice. This is a sort of holy. They say the Buddha left his palace. He was very rich, right? Wealthy beyond measure. Kind of like maybe he would be like the heir to, you know, he's a prince. So imagine princes, he had three palaces and all kinds of stuff. He gave it all away and became a beggar, basically. Uh, you know, <clears throat> then he started, uh, you know, begging for food. And they say that when, after he was enlightened and he came back to his village. So he didn't leave permanently. He left for seven years. He came back. His father was embarrassed that his son was walking up and down the street because monks always carry a bowl and they, they go for alms round. So they completely rely on the community to feed them. That's how the monasteries work. Uh, all over the world, the ashrams, people give money to spiritual practitioners so they can practice. You are here as, from the result of tremendous generosity from others. Right? I'm here because of the generosity of others. When I look around the center, I always remember like when mer many of these items were given to us in here. <laughs> like I can just remember it. Like I know I've told the story a million times about this statue. Uh, Jack Cornfield, the founder of Spirit Rock, he gave us this statue when we opened and we were on Broadway. And um, he picked it out in Thailand. So he had it all the way from Thailand to come to the United States. And it was at Spirit Rock for a couple of years sitting. And then he was like, that's the one. And then we carried it down Broadway. It's really heavy. It doesn't look like it, but it took four of us. And then we were carrying, we had, somehow we got, we, I don't know why we were walking so far down the street, but we were carrying it all the way down Broadway. And it seemed like this moment, you know, like installing it in Oakland on the corner, downtown Oakland, you know, this Buddha statue, it awakened mind, you know, right here. So it's sort of exciting. But we were the recipients of enormous generosity. You know, people gave so much to us when we were opening EBMC. 
as a gift where I would weep sometimes looking at them, thinking, oh, that's so sweet, right? So that's the power of it. It's meant to be joyful. It's meant to open your heart. It's meant to be connective, right? And the seeds that are planted are powerful because what happens is that energy ripens and comes back. Right? It's like we send out a sandwich and then we get back a casserole. That's one of my teachers used to say that. Right? <laughs> I don't know why she used to say that. That was Kamala Masters. This is a Filipino. She was in the Philippines. They would say stuff like that. But It's to believe that you have enough. That there's nothing worse. Honestly, there's nothing worse for my mind than to feel like I'm in the poverty in here. Like, I have nothing, right? To believe that thought again and again. You know that th- thought? Like, I have nothing. I need, I need, I want, I want, right? We, we don't see that everything all around us, right? Like, oh, I'm actually being cared for. Even if I'm just standing outside on the curb, I have everything I need in this moment. So generosity is that replenishing of that. Like, I have, not only do I have enough, but here you go, <laughs> Right? Even if it's five cents. It's not the amount, it's the intention. So I'm exploring this for myself. As I go away on retreat, I decide to give away everything almost. As I decide to give away my car. I decided to just practice this radical generosity. Like, what would happen if I just let go a ton of things? I'll get it all again. That's the thing. It appears and disappears. <laughs> appears and disappears and appears and then that's how you get more fluid you're like oh yeah this appears and disappears well here's two for you (laughs) right here's some for you oh wow it's appearing again here's some for you that's the magic of it the more you send out the more the cup is filling 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 but i can't tell you that you have to see it that's everybody's individual power in their practice like Nobody could tell you how that operates. It's a magic that individuals discover. It's a discovery of how it works. Like, ah, this great power is a love currency, right? It's like, ah, it just keeps going out. It keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's a beautiful thing. My teacher, Jack, is someone whose uh, generosity has, like, really astounded me when I've seen it. One time, I'll just tell you a quick story, and then... Um, we'll take some questions. One time uh, we were in Spirit Rock and on the Monday night there's a big song of 300 people usually that gather on Monday night at Spirit Rock. So the Donna baskets are very full, right? And Coco Man, you guys know Coco Man Cladi? Oh, he's a drummer and he started the Attitudinal Healing Center in West Oakland and he, him and his wife, they would drum and do a lot around healing racism. I'm not sure if they're still over there, but we used to teach together, Kokoman and I, mindful drumming and meditation a uh, long time ago. So he uh, came to Spirit Rock. I invited him to come on Monday night because he teaches mindful drumming. And I was like, you know, this is so great. You know, we, we were going to, we were planning our retreat working together and, um, so he started, I introduced him to Jack, and um, he started telling him all about the children in West Oakland. So without even a second's hesitation, Jack started bowing on the ground to him, and then insisted that he take all the dawn of baskets with him, right? Everything in the dawn of baskets. And it was just like one of those moments where you just touch, and he was like, here, I bow to you, and the children in West Oakland, take all the money. It was just a moment of open-heartedness. Right? And I've seen him do that so many times, and I just thought, wow, what a powerful teaching. Yeah, it just, it just, it's touching. When you see something like that, you cry. Like, that's so sweet. Even witnessing others. So celebrate other people's generosity, too. The worst thing you could do is somebody's going to do something radical and give something away. is go, don't do that. Cling on to it. <laughs> People do that all the time. My friends used to do that when I was in India, and I would give to all the beggars. They'd be like, stop, stop. And I was like, I can't. I want to. And they would try to, you're making an industry. Don't do it. Stop. Don't give to that child. And they would just be begging me to stop. And I was like, I just can't. If you guys can't watch it, you're going to have to go in the cafe or whatever. But I was out there giving all these rupees away, you know. Uh, 
celebrate someone's act, even if it seems crazy to you, right? We're encouraging letting go, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, that's crazy to give all that away. Okay, if that's what you feel drawn to, I'll watch you and celebrate with you. Not to make someone feel ashamed, guilty, or stupid, <laughs> right? Like, why did you do that? Because regret is what under undercuts a lot of our goodness. So you have to do it wisely, right? We give wisely, right? You don't give your whole rent check away the day before it's due, right? You don't, you don't do stuff like that. At, um, Agape, when I was younger, this is the last story, Agape, <laughs> with Reverend Michael Bethwith. He was my first teacher when I was a teenager and was living in L.A., and he would give these rousing talks on generosity, like, yeah, and we'd all be like, yeah, writing checks. And he'd be like, and one week, he's like, please, you guys, last week, half the check found, so please. <laughs> You're costing us money. Give wisely. You know, I know you were all fired up, or I got everybody all worked up. But he was really like, it's an art to that, right? So, you know, you weigh all of those out, right? You weigh the factors out. So, so I just want to stop right there and see if there's any questions about generosity. Yeah, let's let's pass the microphone. That's great. We have one right. So, one of the things maybe this comes from the question of balance when it comes to giving and taking and kind of figuring out with that is, um, and this has especially been coming up this week, um, I have a tendency to just, to just give and it takes a toll in some of it being a need, like, to be able to receive. Yeah. It's not necessarily that it has to be reciprocal with those who I give back to, but I guess, um, how do we navigate, um, just like who and where we kind of direct our kind of giving toward. And maybe for me, it comes from like, say friends, you consistently give and give and give. And there's just like... <laughs> yeah, so over giving. Yeah. Yeah, and depletion yeah. and burnout, they all go the same. That, yeah. So you want to have, you have to be able to give to yourself too and receive for yourself. So. When you're giving from a place of, and it's not genuine, you might as well not even do it, right? If you're giving and you feel resentful, like, oh, here you go, now zip it, or whatever, you know. <laughs> God, you already gave you $100, you don't have plenty, you know, what, okay. And then, right, it's not really good, actually. It's actually not helpful. It, we want to give in the highest way, the most powerful way, the most awakened way. <laughs> Right? If it's not genuine, don't do it. You know, sometimes when people ask me, it doesn't mean, just because I'm talking about generosity, that I give every single thing and I give every time I'm asked for something. I really, it's like, how does this feel in my heart? If this no longer feels good in my heart, I stop. Yeah, you know, if it just, you don't have to do it out of a duty. Sometimes we give out of a lot of different motivations other than pure generosity. We give we want attention, we want love. Sometimes we give because we want other people to see us and think like, wow, we're so generous, you know? So that's a big one, right? So we have to be aware of when it's authentic. If the giving isn't a genuine happiness, stop until it is. And if it doesn't feel right with that person, then we direct it another place, right? Until we feel that when we think of the person and the gift or we think of what we want to do or we want to help them in some way, we wait until it's purified and then we act from that purified place, right? As much as we can. Sometimes the motivations are mixed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we want to help, we kind of don't, we kind of do, <laughs> and then maybe we go for it, right? But as much as you're in the act of giving or doing or offering anything to be cognizant, giving is happening. <laughs> Even if it's just five cents on the street, wait, giving is happening, I am giving. And to celebrate it in that moment as your practice. This is practice, it's to take joy. Ah, this is part of my practice. It changes the landscape, right? And so there, that's kind of what I would suggest. Let it be natural in your heart. Thank you. Yeah, a couple more. 
I'm curious what you have. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate this topic. It would it actually really move me your talk. Um, and I, I really appreciate uh, like the emphasis, you know, uh, accepting gifts graciously and like how beautiful it is when you give people a gift and they accept it graciously or even when you're able to accept the gift graciously. Um, it just brought up two things to my mind, the, the concept of generosity, because I think I have sometimes like a little bit of a like complex relationship to generosity, mostly around like two things. Like one, I think is like, I, I think that there's stuff around people, people questioning when you do things to feel good. Like you were talking about how like, you know, there's a big payback in giving. And I think that there's like, like, you know, there's sometimes a stigma attached to, oh, you did this thing because you wanted to feel good. Not necessarily like for this other person to feel good. Um, so I was just wondering what you thought about that. And then the second thing kind of related to the question of power is like, you know, like for example, Warren Buffett, you know, mm -hmm. whose son actually wrote an op-ed after his dad did that, that talked about, you know, the charitable industrial complex and how for a lot of rich people, it's a way of kind of like washing your hands of like the dirty that you've done, you know, like smash union organizing on the one hand and like force people to live at poverty wages and then like take the money you've accumulated from that profit to like give it away and be like, look how wonderful I am. So like, I just wonder like, is there, there a necessary like, connection between like your motivation and the ways that you get what you give? Mm -hmm. And is it like the act pure and of itself? Or can it like, you know? It can be multi, yeah. So just to know that, you know, I definitely bring up Warren Buffett. He's definitely no angel. I should have mentioned like a few things about that. It was just that in that moment, there seemed to be a purity when he was giving that gift you know, and, and yeah, rather he's getting out of his sins or guilt or redemption in his mind of all the dirt. Exactly. Um, so to say that with all of these qualities is tainted sometimes, you know, we give for a lot of reasons and the, the, the idea is to give with happiness and a sense of interconnectedness with the person. So your happiness should derive a little bit from somebody enjoying the object that you gave. Like for instance, when I was moving out of this house a few months ago, there, there, a guy pulled up in a truck, and I had this furniture outside, and he goes, that would go great in my church. And I thought, great, yeah, good. I wanted it gone, and it went in his church. I was like, excellent. So the two co-worlds of happiness together, right? I'm getting rid of this stuff that I don't want to deal with, right? It's on the curb, and he has this great place in his church, and he can use that. So it's like you want those two to be, we're always purifying so the closer we can get to, I'm happy because they're happy, we're on the right path, right? Again, this is the path of purification, right? And the mind is infinitely diluted and it pulls up all kinds of mixed motivations. Like I'll give all this, and I, I, maybe I'll be forgiven for the time I stole money from the whole of Southeast Asia. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it could be that. So we just wanna, but it's still happening. So we just want to be aware of that. So you guys, this could go on for a while, but it's nine o'clock on where that people are starting to go. So if you want to ask me questions, you can stay. <laughs> uh, you can stay and ask me. I'll be sitting up here. But it's a powerful practice. So just do your best. We'll sum it down to this. Try to let go as much as you can with awareness. Whenever you're letting go of something, and at that moment, try to develop happiness and interconnected feeling. Let's just simplify it like that. And celebrate yourself after you did it. <laughs> like, good, I gave. Good for me. Yeah? Something like that. So, so I just want to um, just thank you so much for your talk tonight. Um, it kind of leads into Donna. Um, the center runs on generous giving. Um, without your giving, the center is nothing. So um, so we have two baskets located here to the right and to the back. Um, one of the baskets is to help uh, sustain our teacher, and the other is to help sustain a center. And um, as long as you keep 
generously giving to support our teachers in, this, in the center, we'll be able to continue to create space for, for people of color to come as a refuge. So thank you for, um, yeah, thank you for a lovely sit tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, um, all the volunteers. I think it went off. All the volunteers and everybody, <laughs> good luck with your practice and come back next week, right? Every week, it's good to practice. Your meditation is an act of generosity. The healed mind that you develop is benefits all of us, right? So thank you for that. That's a big one, actually. So thank you for your practice and your love and your hearts and... We'll see you next week. Okay, everyone. Namaste.